Good morning, everybody, and welcome to South Bay Presbyterian Church. And I am so happy to be here, um, especially because I do not have air conditioning at home. <laughs> and this is so nice right now. I might live here. <laughs> I am Elder Norman Liu. Um, I'm Elder of the Month for, of September, and I would just like to thank Grace uh, for um, covering for me last weekend. Um, I'm going to give you a little mini testimonial right now what I was doing last weekend. Um, last weekend, my son, Daniel, got married. So thank you. It was a nice um, s small ceremony up in uh, like the overlooking the West Cliffs of Hellas Verdes. Um, my wife has some pictures on her iPhone if you want to take a look. <laughs> I'm sure she'll be happy to show you. Um, but I, I just want to just say how I'm so blessed. Um, I, I jokingly say all the time that there's three things that my children can, that I want my children to avoid doing. One is ending up in jail. Number two is being addicted to drugs or alcohol. Number three is marrying somebody I do not like. <laughs> Actually, number three is number one. Um, I just kiddingly say that, although that's kind of true. I mean, those things we don't want of our children. So I, I'm just so blessed that the Lord blessed us uh, with a new daughter whom we love. Her family is just outstanding. We just love them too. They're, they're, they're friendly, they're fun, and uh, we just enjoyed spending time with them. So we just, uh, I just want to thank God for that blessing for, for, uh, for our entire, the, the Lou family. Um, so as always, um, Please silence your cell phones, and uh, if you're online, um, uh, please go on mute, but uh, leave your video on, because we know, I, I work from home, so I know that sometimes we just roll out of bed, but you guys look great even then. So just want you to know that. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, um, you know, you can just uh, find me and slip it to me. Oh, excuse me, slip it to me. And um, today, our guest speaker will be Rich Hung, whom you're familiar with. So uh, let me open in prayer. Lord, uh, we just thank you so much for, um, for all your blessings uh, this Sunday, um, just getting us through this uh, time of hot weather, but um, uh, just knowing that you're the, um, you're, you're the one behind all that. So... Uh, we have hot weather, we have cold weather, we have everything, and uh, just uh, just it goes to uh, show your power, Lord. Um, we just um, thank you for just comforting us, uh, for providing us, for providing for us, and uh, we just ask that you uh, be with Rich as he delivers the message, and just uh, keep our hopes, our hearts open to it. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Um, so if you can stand up if you can and just uh, look over to your neighbors and give them a big hi, a uh, smile, and um, just greeting. Thank you. prepare to worship in song um i'd ask that you remain standing if you can but i do see that edwin is on with us this morning edwin hi it's good to see you i'm glad you could join us this morning glad you're feeling well enough so edwin was sick a little bit for a bit but he seems well enough to join us this morning so we're good to see him glad to see him. so this is the house of the lord and it is a house of joy and whenever i think of that i think of two people in particular i think of erlinda and I think of grace, because every time I see them here, their hearts are filled with joy. And so that's why this is the house of the Lord. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who ever more will be.
things in this world and many times we ask why did you make me Lord you created us to worship you that is our sole purpose is to worship you Lord and we come before you this morning as your children to worship you Sweetest of love, where my heart be 
Heavenly Father, we would just ask that your presence would be among us this morning, that your Holy Spirit can be with us, guiding us through this service. Thank you, Lord, for being our God. In your son's precious name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, SBPC family. My name is Dorothy Jung. I'm the prayer coordinator for SBPC. This morning, I have the honor and privilege to lead us in our time of corporate prayer. Will you join me? Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us so much and calling us your children. You are the creator of the universe, our Lord and Savior, our counselor. Lord, we want to worship you, treasure you, and adore you for being our loving and compassionate God. Thank you for the privilege of prayer and confession where we can lay our sins at your feet. Forgive us for all our negative thoughts of worry and stress, anger or jealousy, our ignoring you and not making you the first priority in our lives or trying to control our own situation. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Thank you for bringing Pastor Chris to be our shepherd in this season. May we work together in the unity of the spirit to continue your ministry at SBPC and glorify your name. Be with us as we strive to do your will. As your bride, the church, we pray that you will guide us, provide for us, care for us. Show us how to share your awesome gospel message to our unchurched friends and family. We continue to pray for our church leaders as they work through all the steps of the transition and decisions of our future, waiting upon you and your guidance. We also lift up the nominating committee in search of new leaders for 2023. Father, we thank you for the nudges and calls on those you have already chosen to do your work. May they see you clearly in this process and your will for their lives. Give them the joy in their hearts as they serve you. Father, we come before you as broken people. We need you and realize that you control all things. When we face unsettling times, we know you are always with us. We are dependent on you alone. We come humbly before you to pray for those dealing with stress or depression, new challenges in life, the loss of loved ones or suffering from illness or pain, or those who may not feel close to you now. Today on this day of remembrance of the dark day in our country's history, we come before you now to ask for healing for those suffering loss of family and friends on that day. Heal our nation, Lord, we pray. You promise never to leave us or forsake us. At this time, we pray for Grant and Carol Tom's daughter, Jeanette, as she goes through chemotherapy treatments, Lord. Draw near to all those dealing with challenges and trials unspoken. We know you know our needs even before we speak them. Guide us, comfort us, help us to have an even deeper relationship with you. Draw near to us so we can experience the warmth of your loving arms, your healing hand, and especially feel and experience your presence this day and always. Be with our guest speaker, our brother in Christ, Rich Hung, as he speaks your truth. Anoint his lips for your glory. May they be a sweet sound to you, Lord. Thank you for our time of worship so we can experience your magnificence, glory, and deep love. We give you all our praise. In your precious son's holy name, we pray. Amen. Hello. Oh, thank you, Dorothy. Um, I forgot a couple. I forgot to mention a couple of things earlier. Um, first of all, my son's new wife, his name is Melanie, and our good friend of this church, Joshua Yi, officiated the ceremony. So, so I'll let you know that. So it was really nice. So anyway. Um, I am honored to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, he is no stranger to this church, and I have it on good authority that he is um, in the top two of favorite son-in-laws of Arnold and Elaine. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Rich Hung. Thank you, Norman. Thank you, Norman, and thank you, Dorothy. I was really ministered through your leading in prayer there. And um, greatly encouraged and touched, so thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be back here again. I usually preach once or twice a year, so every time I come, I, I really uh, see it as a great joy and privilege and honor. So um, also, it's a great privilege to be preaching the living Word of God um, 
here this morning is why I counted a great honor to preach God's word and uh, to bring it to you here this morning. Um, I was just thinking of this before I go into just a word of prayer, but this came out of my quiet time this past week. It comes from Luke chapter 8, verse 15. You don't need to uh, turn there, but you can just listen. And this is just kind of the end of the parable of the sower and the seeds. And here Jesus says, As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. So would you pray with me? Father, we just pray that as... I preach your word, God, as your people hear your word here physically, in person, or over Zoom, God, that you would bless um, every heart here to be a, a heart that is good soil, that as your word goes forth, that they would hold it fast, and in due season, God, that it would bear fruit if they do not give up. So, Father, we just pray for your encouragement. We pray for you to do uh, what only you can do in our hearts. So use me, help me to get out of the way. And uh, may you have your way in me and through us. And may you be glorified in this time. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Uh, Christian brothers and sisters, you need to know that God wants you to be alive. Fully alive to him and fully alive to those around you. And here's our key idea this morning if you're taking notes. Being alive means experiencing intimacy with Jesus. Being alive means to experience intimacy with Jesus, which then begs this question for us this morning, how can you have intimacy with Jesus so that your faith is alive? How can you have intimacy with Jesus so that your faith is alive? I want to offer two ways you can experience intimacy with Jesus so that your faith is alive in today's culture. Open up your Bibles or your apps, uh, whatever you can get the scriptures to Daniel chapter 2, and we'll look at Daniel chapter 2 and 3 this morning, kind of back and forth. Daniel chapter 2, so go ahead and turn there. If you're reading out of an ESV, Daniel chapter 2 is on page two, uh, 738. 738, if you're reading out of an ESV Bible. And in Daniel chapters 2 and 3, we're going to observe a couple ways we can grow in our intimacy with Jesus, especially when there are power and forces all around you and perhaps your adult children, perhaps your growing grandchildren, and powers attempting to get you and perhaps those around you to bow down to anything other than the living God and to silence your witness for Jesus. In Daniel chapter 2, the setting is the king's court. And really, that's a representation of power and authority in this world. And the king who sits on the throne of that court is King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar, in this time, he's angry. And his anger is turned and kindled into fury. Why? He has this dream. And no one can tell the king his dream. He hasn't told it to anybody, but he wants them to, someone else to tell him the dream that he had and to tell him the interpretation So then the king commands all the wise men of Babylon, which included Daniel and his three friends, to be destroyed. And what I want to do is I want to start in verse 10 of chapter 2, where the magicians, the enchanters, and Chaldeans have already gone back and forth with King Nebuchadnezzar in a conversation, saying they can't tell the king this dream nor the interpretation. And this is how the wise men of Babylon respond for the third time in this back and forth conversation with King Nebuchadnezzar, starting in verse 10. Look at that with me to verse 12, through verse 12. Thou Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter a Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. Verse 12, because of this, the king was angry and very furious, and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. The death sentence for all of the wise men of Babylon was spelled out explicitly. If you go back to verse 5 of chapter 2, where it says this, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. 
this is problematic. That's an understatement. This is a major crisis. And the incredible thing is, is that Daniel, and when he hears of the king's plans to kill all the wise men of Babylon, including him and his three friends, Daniel does not respond with defeatism. He does not respond with any kind of defeat. He does not say, hey guys, it's over. The king is out to get us, so go back home and say your goodbyes while you still have the chance. No, Daniel does not act with any kind of defeat or any kind of a spirit of defeatism. And I think there's something here for us because I think sometimes as believers, we can tend towards defeatism. Right? We, we hear of some problem. We hear of some difficulty and we can easily throw in the towel immediately. Right? We, we give up far too early. Perhaps your adult children or others that you know are abandoning their faith. Right? Maybe you know people where their marriages are on the rocks. A family member is going through some rough spots in life and health. And we just seem like, man, COVID is never going away. And so it's easy to feel defeated. I guess their marriage isn't going to work, right? I guess it's over. I guess this family member is just beyond recovery. I guess we're just going to be wearing masks for the rest of our lives. I guess that's just it. And so we just resign. And we're tempted to give up. This morning, you might be sitting here or listening in and feeling defeated in your faith. And I actually have good news for you. And the good news is this, is Jesus is resolved for you who feel resigned. Jesus is resolved for you who feel resigned. Jesus is determined where you feel defeated. And perhaps as we zoom out, right, not just defeated, you and I were dead. You and I were dead in our sins. Meaning Jesus was resolved and determined to come and draw near to you and me and even to raise us up from the grave, to to bring us from death into life through the cross and the resurrection, right? Praise God. And so Daniel doesn't respond with defeat. Another thing Daniel doesn't do is Daniel does not run away. Daniel doesn't run to his three friends, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and say, boys, put on your sandals, tie them real tight, right? We're going to kick some dirt and hightail out of Babylon tonight because the king is out to get us, and we need to save our own skin before it's too late. No. Daniel does not run away. Daniel remains. Daniel remains. Daniel remains in his corner of the king's highest court, and he stands and he speaks with courage. Which brings us to the first way we can experience intimacy with Jesus in our culture today is to stand and speak with courage. If you're taking notes, that's point number one, is to stand and speak with courage. I want to share a story with you of a high school student named Vivian. I know this story because I serve in youth ministry. And Vivian, she wasn't standing in the king's highest court. No, she was standing behind a table at her high school uh, promoting her Christian club. And Vivian was trying to launch her Christian club at her high school to invite students to let them know about her club at the club fair that the high schools typically have so they could come and join her and learn more about God or be encouraged in their faith if they were believers. And there, she actually experienced other students opposing her Christian faith. And the students who came up to her in this particular instance asked her, do you hate us? Do you hate us? And these students were from the LGBTQ club. And this is not a knock on the LGBTQ club. This is just her story of what happened. And Vivian responded that she did not hate them. In fact, she lovingly and graciously shared that she did not agree with their lifestyle and shared what the Bible has to say about it. And in return, Vivian was mocked for her faith right then and there and received vile words and lewd acts performed right in front of her, right there at her school. Vivian was under fire from her peers at her school last year. But instead of giving up and feeling defeated, instead of running away and saying, this is too hard, forget it. No, she stood and spoke with courage. And not only that, she was excited to continue on and keep sharing the good news of Jesus Christ despite the opposition. She committed to walk that path of Jesus as he did nothing wrong and he kept sharing the truth and people accused him of doing wrong when he had done nothing wrong. Vivian is alive. Vivian is alive like Daniel. 
Daniel, who had courage to stand and speak as a child of the living and most high God. Wow. Let's see it for ourselves. Starting here in verse 13 of chapter 2. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed. And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied, or spoke, with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. And he declared to Arioch, the king's captain, this is what Daniel says. He says, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation of that dream to the king. Daniel had courage to secure an appointment in the king's Google calendar, so to speak. Daniel had courage to be decisive when it mattered most. Daniel spoke with prudence and discretion, meaning Daniel spoke without losing his cool. Daniel spoke without blowing his top off. Daniel spoke without melting down, without losing his cool, shutting down. No, Daniel spoke with self-control. Sure, we can see here. Absolutely, what Daniel did took faith. Faith not in himself, but faith in God. God who was in full control. God who has all power. God who has all authority and all wisdom and all dominion over all things. Daniel had faith in God who was, who is, and who will always be above all for all eternity. So, let me bring it to you. Do you trust that God is above all? in this community, in this church, in your job, in your family, in the future of your family, even in your life at this stage of your life, do you trust that God is in control? Whether it's a seemingly good situation and good season in your life today, September 11th, or perhaps a terribly bad situation and an incredibly trying season in your life, church, God is Good. Can I get an amen? God sees all of your ups and downs. And whatever is going on right now as a Christian, you need to know that God has not left you. God has not felt defeated or ran away on you. No, God is presently with you in it all. As a matter of fact, he stands with you. He stands with you. As a believer, you need to know that without a shadow of a doubt that God stands with you. And if you think about that, Think about it. That's actually where true Christian courage comes from. Christian courage does not come from knowing how good and great you are, but it comes from knowing how good and great God is, the biggest, wisest, most powerful and loving being of all the universe for all time and eternity stands with you. That almighty God himself stands with you. He intercedes for you and he will deliver you. But here's a question. Will you and I still stand and speak for the Lord, even if he does not deliver you? Will you stand and speak for the Lord, even if it means receiving vile words and vile acts like Vivian? Will you go all out on your faith, no matter the consequences, like Daniel's three friends? Will we stand and speak for the Lord, even if it means experiencing opposition for the truth? Now, in Daniel chapter 3, jump over there with me. In Daniel chapter 3, Daniel's three friends were sentenced to death for something else. Why? They were unwilling to bow down and worship a golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And if they did not adhere to this new national law, it would be a death sentence for them. How? You know the story. They'd be thrown into the fiery furnace. And so what came about through, what came about legally through a new law nationally, would put incredible pressure on Daniel's three friends spiritually. Daniel chapter 3, starting in verse 4. Look at the scriptures with me or hear the word of God. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages. This is the decree. This is the decree. This is the new law. That when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, that was the signal for them. You are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. 
Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of all those instruments, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Stop right there. For Daniel's three friends, this would be, this trial would be in a disruption, either a disruption to their intimacy and loyalty to God or approving of it. Their intimacy with God would either be kept intact or be disrupted. Let's go over to verse 16 of chapter 3. Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. I mean, they're showing him tremendous respect, right? They call him king, but in their conviction is strong. They're saying, no, we're not going to compromise on our faith. Right? But they still treated him with respect. O Nebuchadnezzar, O king. So they're not, there is a defiance here, but because it's coming directly against their faith spiritually. And today it's true. There are dark spiritual forces at work to disrupt and even destroy your intimacy with Jesus. They press in on your heart and minds. And so consider, for example, what kind of headlines, uh, voices, Videos, sound bites, images are attempting to disrupt or displace your intimacy with the Lord. Again, because I serve in youth ministry, here is a high school student's prayer that she penned. Quote, high school girl wrote this prayer. Dear God, I promise that I will not drink this Friday with Stephanie. This is so tempting. I want to go so bad. Well, I thought about it, as you know. And I thought that since you would forgive me anyways, I may as well do it. Then I realize that you will always, always forgive, but you may not let it go unpunished. Then I decided not to do it, strictly out of fear. Then I thought about it more, and I thought that if I did it out of fear, it would not be done because I loved you, I obeyed you, and I followed you. That is my reason for not going now. I know that I will always be faced with temptation, but because I love you, I obey you, and I follow you, I will not fall into the core of it. Thank you, Father. And she drew this little heart, always your child, and she signs her name. So for this student, for her situation, she was tempted to go out and drink with her friend Stephanie, right? There was something at work specifically in her heart, in her mind, to disrupt her intimacy and love of Jesus. And so let me ask you, what might be working to to disrupt your intimacy with Jesus? Are you pursuing acceptance from others even if it means compromising your intimacy with Christ? Are you on a path to sacrifice your relationship with God to pursue position, money, recognition, or amassing more comfort for yourself? One pastor puts it this way, quote, money makes a great gift. I love getting money as a gift. Like, red bag? Like, sweet. Give me a red bag, right? But he said, yeah, money makes a great gift, but it makes a terrible God, end quote. The truth is, money will run out on me, it will run out on you, but God never will. Money won't follow you to the grave, but God will. And not only that, he will bring you back to life. So take inventory today. Who or what is drawing you away from your worship and intimacy with Jesus? Where do you feel pressure to compromise? Don't give in, but remain firm in the Lord and speak, stand and speak with courage for the Lord. Daniel's three friends, they, they understood this. They were being pressured to direct their worship elsewhere to this image, right? Away from God into this image. But the amazing thing about Daniel's three friends at this time is that they deliberately made a choice not to bow down to anything or anyone other than the living God and even accept the consequences. They would rather be thrown into the burning, fiery furnace than be an idolater, They would rather be thrown into the flames than be found unfaithful. And you and I this morning, we can draw encouragement and strength from Daniel and his three friends that have gone before us to stay the course and remain faithful and to stand and speak with courage for the Lord. And here's the thing. When you stand faithful to the Lord, you actually put yourself in a position 
to see the glorious power and presence of God be put on display. See, when King Nebuchadnezzar throws Daniel's three friends into the fire, and if you read the text closely, it was actually turned up seven times hotter than normal, he notices something miraculous. Daniel's three friends are not burned up. And there's not three in the fire, there's actually four. And the fourth looked like a son of the gods. What Daniel's three friends experienced and what King Nebuchadnezzar witnesses is the glory and presence of God protecting and preserving his people even in the flames. And not only that, God reveals his glory to unbelievers through the enduring faith of his people. God wants to reveal his glory through the enduring faith of you and me. Let's see it for ourselves. Jump over with me to verse 24 and 25 of chapter 3. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste, like he like, jumped out of that throne seat that he was sitting on. And he declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king. And he answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Wow. Remember, your courage to stand for Christ does not come from you. Your courage to stand comes from knowing that the God who created the very fires will stand with you in that fire. Whether that fire really is opposition to your faith and persecution for your stance for Christ. Or maybe your fire is things like loneliness, relational or family hardships, or some kind of adversity, trouble, difficulty, or temptation that you're facing today in the season of your life. The God who created you and created this whole universe, stands with you. Do you believe that? The second way to experience intimacy with Jesus so that your faith is alive in today's culture is number two, if you're taking notes, is to share and to seek. Specifically, is to share your needs with those around you and to seek God's mercy for yourself and for others. So I'll break that down for us. Chapter 2 Going back to chapter 2, it starts with a problem, and you guys know, I alluded to it. It starts like this, right? The most powerful earthly person in that time is King Nebuchadnezzar. And he has that troubling dream, right? And no one can tell him the interpretation. He actually, when you read the text closely, he can't sleep. He can't sleep. And because King Nebuchadnezzar does not know God, he looks for answers from the magicians and enchanters and sorcerers. He looks for answers from the spiritual gurus of the land. King Nebuchadnezzar shares his need with people who cannot give him what he's truly looking for, for answers that only God can reveal to him. I think many times we can look to things or people or even passing pleasures for the answer, but those things will always fall short of our heart's true longing, God. For Daniel, he makes his, his need known to his spiritual community. A community that serves and worships the living God, just like we worshiped before this sermon. Let's jump over to verse 17 of chapter 2, and this is what it says. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, his companions. That's the Hebrew names of Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Daniel had the wisdom to make the matter known to his friends. He had wisdom to lean into his godly community to make known the need that was at hand. Now remember the matter that Daniel had made known was that King Nebuchadnezzar was going to destroy all the wise men of Babylon because no one could tell the king his dream nor the interpretation. So Daniel leans hard into his friends. We're honest, me and us, we can a lot of times not be like Daniel. I think a lot of times when there is trial or hardship in our lives, we're tempted to not make the matter known. We don't make it known to our friends. We don't make it known to our family, our spouses, and even our spiritual ears. You're the last one to know. I'm the last one to know. I think we are typically inclined to downplay our personal problems and issues. Why? Well, we don't want to be seen as a nuisance. We don't want to come off as annoying, or we don't want to be an inconvenience to somebody, or perhaps we don't want to show any weakness. It's vulnerable. And so we tend to isolate for one reason or another. And and maybe our environment makes it easy to isolate, right? It's easy to isolate when you have a whole lot of virtual options to choose from. And that's not a knock on those who are chiming in today. There's legitimate reasons. I use Zoom a lot too. 
Or maybe you're relying too heavily on this medium of technology, or that it's easy to hide and conceal our true needs rather than letting it be made known. Or maybe it's loneliness, which is huge here in America among all age groups. It's not just young people. And so since we think we're going to be a bother or inconvenience to somebody, we actually cut ourselves off from the very Christian community that we need. And the truth is, your Christian community, your brothers and sisters, your family and friends need you just as much as you need them to be vulnerable, truthful, and honest. See, if Daniel chose isolation, like he heard this news and he remained quiet, he locked himself in his own room, he would have proved Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1 to be true in his own life. And it says this, Whoever isolates himself breaks out against all sound judgment. Right? So whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. But praise God, Daniel did not walk in folly and foolishness. He walked in wisdom. Daniel knew he needed his three friends to band together to seek mercy from God. And Daniel's three friends, they needed to know what was happening too because this issue, life or death, it mattered to them too. They were part of the wise men who were about to be, about to be destroyed. And that's how it is in the body of Christ. Every individual part, every single one of you, actually affects the whole body. Now, I realize that some issues and problems in your life may not look like or even feel like life or death, right? It's like, I can't relate with this, right? There's, there's not a decree going out in America for, for our heads to be chopped off, right? Like, we're on the chopping block right now. But maybe there's things like this, like pride, comparison, lust, bursts of anger, jealousy, covetousness, laziness, rudeness, and the list goes on. But listen to what James says in chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. He says, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And when sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived. And for some of us here today, sin might look like life for you in the moment. Or you just say, that's just how I am. But the truth is, is that any sin, no matter what it is, will lead to death. See, the truth is that sin and Satan want to make, that, make all that is alive in your character and soul to God dead. But God, Jesus, wants to make all that is dead in your soul and character alive. God wants to awaken you to be loving and content and humble, gentle, kind, faithful, and the list goes on. And, I, and here's the thing, part of the intimacy for Christ for you and me will be unlocked through our commitment to the Christian community, the body of Christ, to actually go and share your struggles with a trusted friend who you know will not only listen, but pray with you and for you. Here's the thing. For Christian community to truly be a community where we love one another, we must share our weaknesses and needs because in doing so, we give our fellow and dear Christian family member an opportunity to realize their own needs as well. Oh, I didn't know you struggled with that. I struggle with that too, right? How often have we been in that conversation? Perhaps it's sharing fear over your adult children or grandchildren's future, especially where the culture is heading today. Perhaps it's sharing a struggle with anger or difficulty displaying patience in your marriage. Perhaps it's sharing habitual worry over finances and distraction over your investments. And then after, your sh after you share your struggle, you realize that you and the next person struggles with sin and, and is also a sinner too. And you all simultaneously realize as a community your deep need for seeking mercy from God, your deep need for Jesus. But here's also the thing. Something you need to know is that Christian community is not simply confessing sin and sharing about our weaknesses and struggles and then normalizing it. What I mean is that there can be a temptation to normalize sin because now you know you're not the only one struggling with it. Maybe it's okay. Maybe it's permissible. But that's a deception. Do not be deceived. The thing I want to emphasize that our passage emphasizes this morning is that true Christian community will not lead you or me to sin or keep sinning. True Christian community will direct us towards God. When we share with one another as believers, it should lead us to God. Are the people around you, are your brothers and sisters here pointing you to God? As brothers and sisters here, keep coming around each other and keep pointing each other to God. And that's exactly what Daniel's making the matter known 
to his friends is all about. Daniel doesn't just hear the matter, uh, share the matter with his friends, and it's just, that's it. No, it's for their ears to hear, and then the matter to weigh upon their hearts. And then they are together to enter into the work and labor of prayer by lifting up the matter to God to appeal to his mercy. The ultimate purpose of sharing the matter is for the purpose of seeking the Lord and his mercy for themselves and for others. Why? The enemy death was coming through the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. And for us today, in 2022, the enemy is death coming to destroy us through sin, the world, and Satan. Verse 18 of our passage here says, And Daniel told them, Seek mercy from God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. If you want to be alive unto the Lord and know intimacy with Jesus, start seeking for God's mercy for your own life and also beg God's mercy for the unbeliever. For God to save souls and deliver those lost in sin and darkness and then wait expectantly to see what God will do. For Daniel, God actually responds to him and his three friends and their pleas for mercy. And then Daniel responds by giving God praise and thanksgiving because now Daniel knows the dream. God has given him the dream and the interpretation and lives will be saved. Chapter 2, verse 23, reads this. Daniel says, To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we have asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Without God's intervention and mercy, Daniel and his three friends and all the wise men of Babylon were dead men. But with God's mercy, they are delivered and lives are saved, lives are spared, and even the eyes of unbelievers will see the glory of God, just as Nebuchadnezzar, an unbeliever, will see the glory of God displayed. Chapter 2, jump over to verse 47. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly, your God is the God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. End quote. And for us today, without God's mercy and intervention in our lives, you and I and all humanity stand condemned, right? We know this. The sin separates us from God, and sin must be punished. But praise God, the mystery has been revealed to us. God has been merciful to us. God shares his beloved son with us and seeks our hearts and souls by putting the punishment for our sins upon the son through Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross so that we can be saved, so that we could be made alive. And that's what happens when you seek the mercy of God for yourself and others. God saves. And God will display his glory to an unbelieving and watching world, resulting in hearts and mouths being full of praise and thanksgiving. That's what it's all about. Almost a year ago, the Lord gave us our second daughter. You might have seen her or heard her crying if you were here early this morning. We named her Rachel Joy Hung. In fact, her birthday is, is this week. One late evening, my beloved wife here asked me, do you know Rachel Joy is the name of the Christian girl who was killed in the Columbine High School massacre? I said, I didn't know that. And then I asked my wife, did you? And she said, no. And I was like, well, where's this conversation going to go? I asked her another question. I said, how does that make you feel? And my wife responded, it's encouraging because Rachel Joy Scott was a young and bold Christian who stand for Jesus, even though she was not delivered. Rachel Joy Scott, you might remember, was the first of 13 who was shot and killed by a fellow high school student over 20 years ago. I can't believe it. I remember that. I was in college. Just horrific, tragic, unthinkable, terrible. Rachel Joy Scott was also the high school girl who penned that prayer that I read to you earlier, praying to God about her temptation to go out and drink with her friend Stephanie. It has been reported that, man, I'm getting so emotional here. It has been reported that Rachel was asked by the student that took her life if she believed in God 
And instead of denying Christ, she stood her ground and spoke with courage. And it cost her her life. It cost her her life. And I think I get so emotional. I read up more on Rachel Joy Scott and learned that she was an incredibly strong Christian. She wrote so much about her faith in journals, penning a lot of her prayers to the Lord in journals like the one I shared with you. And from one of the websites that her dad set up for her, it says this, quote, she had no idea that her simple words and acts of kindness would one day help prevent bullying and save teens from self-harm and suicide and even deter gun violence in schools. Do you guys know where we're living today? We hear this all the time. Don't become numb to it. God wants to make us alive in our faith. Wake up. Rachel was alive because she, had a, she has a kind of intimacy with the Lord that could withstand pressure, conformity, and even mockery for her faith. Rachel wrote things like this, quote, Don't let your character change with, the, with your environment. Don't let your character change with your environment, end quote. In fact, there's a movie called I Am Not Ashamed. Obviously, it comes from Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, where Apostle Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. I want to see that movie. I haven't had time yet. The Lord has used Rachel's life and faith to help touch and save the lives of many, even these last 20 years. And God desires to continue to use your life and the life of this church to stand and speak with courage and to share your needs with each other because we can't do it alone and to seek God's mercy for yourself. We need to pray. We need to have a prayer life ourselves individually. But to come together, and, and Dorothy modeled this beautifully this morning, right? To seek God's mercy for this world that we live in. So remember, being alive means experiencing intimacy with Jesus. And I pray if you don't feel like it applies now, that just, I read, just I, as I read to you from the parable of the sower, that we would hear the word, that we would keep it in our hearts, in a good and honest heart, and with patience bear fruit in God's due time if we do not give up. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. God, thank you for... Um, This truth, God, this is the truth of your word. And Father, if we feel like it's not applicable to us today, right now in a specific situation that we're going through, God, may we remember your word so that we might be prepared when that time comes, that by the Holy Spirit, just as we sang, Father, that we would speak with boldness and courage, that we would not compromise our faith, that like Rachel Joy said, we would not let our character change change color with our environment, but that we would stand true to you. So God, we pray for mercy. I pray for mercy for myself and for my brothers and sisters here and who are listening in, God, that you would give us grace, that you would encourage our hearts, that you would give us courage because we know that you're with us and that we could rest knowing that our courage doesn't come from ourselves, Our boldness doesn't come from something we need to muster up from ourselves and within us, but it comes with the fact that you are with us. Emmanuel, God with us. So we praise you for Jesus. We thank you for this time. Bless this church. Bless your people. Use them and minister to them and through them in special and specific ways that you know they, that they need today and in this week and in this busy season. In Jesus' name, amen.
church was called in the power of the spirit to the Lord to deliver captives and to preach good news in every corner of the earth. We will stand as children of the prophet. We will fix our Thank you, worship team. Um, and thank you for everybody who puts the Sunday experience together. Uh, ushers, greeters, planners, and, and the crew behind there. Thank you very much. It's much appreciated. Um, now is the time for tithes and offering. And um, I, too, do like the gift of money, as Rich said. And, uh, but I have to keep in mind where that gift came from. It came from God. And God wants us to use that responsibly. Um, one of the ways we could do that is to do offering um, and to put it to good use. Uh, Pastor Chris, Chris Kuhn actually gave a um, sermon, maybe in July, about um, giving, prayer, things like that, and uh, how not to make a big fanfare of, of clinking your coins into that jar or whatever, like in the old days, like ding, 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 ding. And I, the first thing that came to mind was when I'm at a, a restaurant getting takeout and that tip jar is there and I try to get the attention of that person, here it goes. <laughs> I want them to know what's going in there. But we don't want to do that right now. And I know we're all pretty good about that. So, um, And you also mentioned, you know, just kind of be quiet about it, anonymous, anonymous. But I think as Elaine will tell you, it's okay to let the IRS know that you're giving. Because we may get some money back for that, and we can put it back here quietly. So um, we have uh, several ways to give, the offering box. We also have mail, PayPal, and we have uh, online uh, bill pay that you can use. So, uh, so let us pray. Lord, uh, we just thank you for the gifts. Um, you bless us many times over. And we uh, just want it to be in our hearts to give back some of what you've given to us. Um, we, we pray that we put it to good use, that the ministries are just inspired to, um, to use this uh, gift, all our gifts, uh, not just money, but all our spiritual gifts um, and physical gifts that you give us to, to um, go out there and... and Make disciples. Uh, spread the word, Lord. Uh, that's what we're here for. And uh, we just uh, thank you for all that. And thank you for just your constant blessings upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I would ask you all to stand and join us for this time when we 
sing How Great Is Our God. And Norman talked about Pastor Chris was giving a message a few weeks ago. I remember Pastor Chris was giving a message on seeking you first. And how a lot of times we put things first in our lives. And this was the children's message. And he was talking to the kids and he was trying to express the importance of putting God first. And so he was talking about how sometimes we put our family first or our friends or our toys. And he says, do you know what you should have above everything else? And my granddaughter, Haley, raised her hands. And I says, oh, no, what's she going to say? <laughs> and she said, God. And I just, oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> all the things that God does, he is in control. And he should be the name above all of our names.